Hey everyone, what's up? Force here, and today we got some updates for Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, before we get into it, by the way, can I just say how pumped I am? This is looking like one of the better games launching in the first half of 2024, and that makes me so very happy. The original, even for all of its praise, was a had a did have a relatively small following, all things considered, and I think it just deserved far more success than it ended up seeing. Anyway, the point is to see Dragon's Dogma 2 shaping up to be a proper sequel that builds upon the strengths of the original while not straying too far from it, or very far at all, to be honest, puts this game just super high up on my most anticipated list. There was so much that was so very cool about the original Dragon's Dogma, and I'm just happy to see that Dragon's Dogma 2 is looking as good as it is. Anyway, we got a handful of new updates, uh, gameplay, and information uh, throughout the course of this past week, so let's dive into it. First and foremost, uh, we got some details coming out of Play Magazine. They released an interview with Dragon's Dogma's director, Itsuno, where they talked a bit about the game. So it opens up with uh, him being asked his thoughts on the original becoming a cult classic over the years and why it took so long for them to make the sequel. To which he said, I really wanted to make a sequel right after the game came out. So sorry for making everyone wait so long. I've been so grateful to see so many fans appreciate the quality of the game and support it for so many years. Having fans support the game, both inside Capcom and out, is definitely something that helped push the project towards realization. And it honestly makes a lot of sense for why it took so long for the sequel to come to fruition for it to even get greenlit because for as much praise as the original Dragon's Dogma gets today it wasn't always so well regarded when it originally released in 2012 critics pretty much panned it across the board for being overly difficult too complicated and way too convoluted as a result the average review score for this game um, when it when it came out as far as I recall was like about a six out of ten or something like that, but just didn't review terribly well. And it sold under 1 million units in its first year, which was a bit below Capcom's projections for the game. However, over time, what critics seemed to dislike about the game turned out to be both appealing and endearing to a lot of the player base. As a result, in the decade since its release, over a decade now, Dragon's Dogma, as well as its expansion, Dark Arisen, has sold nearly 7 million copies. So clearly the game was doing something right. And what was it that made a Dragon's Dogma so great? Well, at the time, and still even by today's standards, it offered a really unique blending of systems and mechanics seen in action games and RPGs and adventure games, and really kind of put them all together. For one, it had challenging action combat that was a bit reminiscent of Dark Souls, but in a much larger world. And keep in mind as well, Souls-like combat was still a relatively new phenomenon at the time, with Demon Souls having released in 2009, and Dark Souls coming out in 2011. When Dragon's Dogma came out, there weren't very many many Souls-like games or games of Souls-like combat besides the two original Souls-likes, it was still considered uh, almost a bit of an acquired taste. Like Moxie, if you ever heard of it. It's this drink. I used to have it a bunch in high school. Everyone hated it, and I think just because everyone hated it, I convinced myself that I liked it. I know, I was super cool, right? Beyond that, the game had this monster mounting system, so similar to Shadow of the Colossus or Monster Hunter even, where you could grab and climb any of the larger enemies in the game, maneuvering yourself to uh, get a good angle on their various weak spots. They had a character creation that was a about a whole lot more than just changing the appearance of your character. Various aspects of your physique, your height, your weight, and your build would actually have a direct impact on gameplay, affecting things like how much you could carry, how far you could throw objects, or even your ability to fit through certain parts of the terrain. And then there was the pawn system, which was probably one of the biggest interesting, unique kind of selling points of the game. At its core, they're just AI companions, but they're really so much more as they learn and grow while they adventure alongside you, being able to actually help guide you, solve puzzles, find objectives, and locate enemy weak points. As they quest, basically, as they do stuff, they will acquire knowledge. They'll pick up knowledge, and then outside of your main pawn, you would then also be able to recruit the pawns of other players and make use of the knowledge that they acquired. So if they went out on quests and adventures, if they farm certain bosses, but you hadn't done that yet, but they were in your group, they would basically aid you in that process, giving you hints and tips, or even like guiding you to a quest location. Really, really cool system. The game in general just did a really good job of creating a sense of adventure and exploration with the challenging combat, with a health that doesn't regenerate, and a night cycle that impacts not only your vision, but even the type of enemies you encounter. All of these things and many more really uh, played into this feeling where going out into the wild became a really exciting excursion. It really forced you to prepare, to play carefully while you were out there, and then to revisit 
town whenever your resources ran low. And that's just some of the stuff that people love so much about the original game, most of which, if not actually all of it, are features and systems that will be returning and improved upon and even added to in the sequel. But anyways, going back to the original point, this game first came out, it really wasn't uh, well reviewed and it wasn't, wasn't considered that great of a game at initial launch, but then over time, as more people played it and word of mouth went around, it steadily grew a more and more dedicated fan base. And we call it a cult classic, but at the same time, it has lifetime sales of nearly 7 million units between uh, Dragon's Dogma and then the Dark Arisen expansion. That is a lot, but also by like AAA RPG standards, it's still considered almost niche. It, it sounds weird when it comes out of my mouth like 7 million sold it's a niche game but I hope you get the picture of what I'm trying to say they want it to be bigger right and I would love it to be bigger as well because I, I just it's so much about the original game is so very cool anyway all right now back to the interview right so next in the article they mention the fact that all of the original games little eccentricities that uh, re will remain intact in Dragon's Dogma 2 and with that the developers are kind of leaning into what fans love about it rather than pivoting into more mainstream systems and mechanics. One such thing being the sort of more grounded nature to the world. Now, Itsuno said he considered the sense of scale and realism to be core parts of the identity of the series, saying, yes, I approach the design of the game's world by thinking about what it would really be like if you woke up tomorrow to find yourself in a fantasy world, and that is something that I think is reflected in every detail of the game. And this grounded, almost realistic, if you want to call it, you know, it's a fantasy RPG, but this sort of almost realistic approach to the world are some of the things that really made that first game interesting that again it will be uh, coming here in the sequel this includes things like these seriously dark nights that require some form of personal illumination a torch a light a spell if you want to be able to see anything i mean think about like a real life nighttime if there's full cloud cover and zero light coming from the moon very very dark that is the sort of darkness that's represented in the nights in dragon's dogma and this darkness often even extends into the interior spaces where things like caves and the inside of dungeons. During nighttime as well, you'll see unique enemies like skeletons, zombies, wisps, and ghosts will appear. Also, another thing that kind of plays into the uh, realism of the world is how your character's physical attributes impact the gameplay. As I mentioned earlier, this will include things like bigger characters will be able to equip heavier items. They'll have more carry capacity and can throw objects further, but then they won't fit into certain tight spaces because of their size, where smaller characters, sure, they'll be able to equip less, but they'll be quicker, more nimble, have more stamina, and we'll, we'll be able to fit through smaller spaces. It's really, really cool. It's not just visual appearance. It literally impacts how you can interact with aspects of the world and even gameplay mechanics. And then the pawn system and how they acquire knowledge and then share those details with players. If you kill a pack of wolves, if you clear, clear a cave of goblins, if you track down a flock of griffins, whatever it is you do, your pawns will gain knowledge on how to more effectively do those things, find those objects, or fight those enemies. They also gain the knowledge of everything else you do, like quests, NPCs you chat with, bosses you fight, and then, like I said, the pawns that you recruit from other players can share info that they experienced with that other player while adventuring with that other player. They can share that inf info when you recruit them to your party, and the game has this whole system. You have your main character, the Arisen is what they're called, and then your one main pawn, but then you're hiring other pawns to fill, fill the rest of your party, and you can freely and, and very regularly swap out the other pawn members in your party to just get ones with different strengths and weaknesses depending on what it is you're doing. It's, it's a super, super cool system for what in other games are just kind of boring throwaway AI companions. The way they do this in Dragon's Dogma is super cool and they're just enhancing that here in the sequel. But also another thing that sort of plays into the realism of the world is like, for example, the ox cart transportation system. These will actively move around the world in real time. So you'll see them coming and going on the roads or as you're in town. And at any point, if you're next to one, you could just jump aboard and go for a ride and then leave as you please. Or maybe while traveling, traveling, you choose to rest, and this would sort of work like a fast travel, but then sometimes while you're resting, it could become under attack, and then you'll have to fight back a group of enemies before the cart is able to continue its travels. So yeah, we know Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to have all those same mechanics, but also now in a world that is four times the size of the original, and with a lot more of an interactive environment. So for example, we've seen we've seen examples of like players throwing explosive barrels at a dam, which cause water to rush out and actually have a physical impact, washing away anything in its path. 
path, including enemies. Like we've seen a few clips of ogres getting washed away and being stunned from the impact of the water. We've seen the ability to destroy bridges to cut off the path of something that's chasing you. We saw examples of like characters pulling on a giant's leg that tripped them up over a ravine and then the giant caught itself and kind of formed this like makeshift bridge in the process. Just super, super cool. Different bits of environmental interaction. And they even have things where like if there are harpies nearby, you can grab a hold of their legs and then they'll take off in the air and you can sort of steer them almost like a glider. Or sometimes if you like grab onto a griffin, they might fly you away to their nest or something. And all of the, it's not like a, a, a cut scene and then you're in the nest. No, like all of this is happening. You're on the griffin, it's flying away, you're over the world, you're seeing all this stuff. Just again, it's a fantasy game, but th there's a lot of elements of it that feel, that make it fleshed out and feel like a real living, breathing place. Really, they do a great job of this, and I'm super excited to see how it's improved in the sequel here. Now, in the interview, Itsuno also touched on some of the more sort of comedic moments that can arise in interactions between the player, with enemies, with NPCs, and with the environment, from stumbling and rolling down a slope and then going into a cave or dangling from a griffin, like I just said, as it carries you off to some unknown location. So of this, Itsuno said, we held multi-day sessions where the team came up with ideas for things that could happen in the game, and the Funniest ideas were always the ones people came up with when our work kept us up late at night. Going on to add, despite the general sort of serious tone of the game's story, they try to keep it fun, saying that when we actually went to implement those ideas, we put aside the question of can we really put something this silly in the game and put in as many of those silly things as possible. Gotta say, I absolutely love this. There's a lot of silly, funny moments that can happen with the pawns, with fighting NPCs, with the environment. We've already seen quite a few of these in the gameplay release so far. So for example, the game looks to make great use of ragdoll physics with enemies, your companion, and even the player often being put into a ragdoll state and having their body just catapulted in all sorts of hilarious ways. And then also those AI companions known as pawns are their very own source of entertainment. Itsuno said, we work to increase not just the number of different voice lines, for the pawns, but also the variety of different situations they would respond to. So you really feel like it's your unique Arisen who raised this particular pawn and that they are a true friend who is by your side on your adventure, giving you words of advice and encouragement. And then also just saying some hilarious stuff in the middle of like everything that's happening. So in some recently released gameplay, uh, in the, the video we got from IGN just the other day, we got a few gems from the pawns. So for example, uh, after the player got smashed by an ogre, one of the pawns said, try not to get hit or after looting some resources that you happen to come by, the pawns would say stuff like, oh, look, materials, useful things, these. One of the funniest ones was in response to the player just getting absolutely rocked by this like massive creature, your pawns were like, hey, well done. <laughs> like it's just, it's just like these, just like funny little quips and moments from the from the pawns, your your NPC companions, and then that plus the ragdoll physics of like going limp in combat, and then just getting just jettapulted and in, into the atmosphere. Like you, the the enemies you're fighting, your companions, the pawns. I, I don't know. There's just a lot of little funny quirky moments that sort of happen in the interaction between all of these things. And I'm glad to hear that the developers themselves appear to be really leaning into it and not shying away from it. Uh, quips aside, pawn can also be super helpful. If you happen to have a difficult quest or boss fight or you need to farm specific enemy types or track down an NPC or look for a treasure, whatever it is, you can actually go out and search for other players' pawns who have already done those things that will end up being a massive help. Pawns who have finished a quest already, it can act as a tour guide, literally showing you the path to their exact location. Or ones who have fought a boss several times with other players, they can clue you into tips on what may be its elemental weaknesses or where certain weak points are on its body and they even have this help command where if at any point you happen to be stuck with whatever it is that you're on any pawn on your team who could have knowledge of a situation where you call for help will assist you so we saw examples of a chest that was just out of player's reach the player calls for help from the pawn and then one of the pawns with the shield has the springboard ability and they lower their shield your player walks up to it and they launch you up to the higher level that otherwise would be inaccessible to you just so many cool interactions are possible with this system. And they have said, besides this whole pool of knowledge and helping you via their experience, um, they've improved the capabilities and the AI of the pawns in the sequel. So for example, they say that they'll be better allies in combat and react more intelligently to whatever it is you're up against. Pawns can launch each other in order to mantle larger enemies. Literally, you'll see examples of pawns picking up and hurling other pawns to grab onto the monster to help you take them down. They'll also periodically alert you to uh, various points of interest, paths, hidden areas, 
areas that you m otherwise might have missed. You can just be walking down a road and a pawn might be, hey, what's that cave over there? And you didn't see it, but the pawn tells you there's a cave over there. So start looking around for a cave. Or pawns can even help you uh, avoid damage from misadventure. If you slip off an edge and a pawn's below you, or if you're holding on to a bird and you lose your grip and you fall down, if a pawn is positioned in the right area, they could catch you, breaking your fall and preventing you from taking a lot of damage or dying. I can't gush enough about the pawn system, and it's so cool to see that they're making big improvements here in Dragon's Dogma 2. Now, in the very last bit of this interview, they mention how the combat classes called vocations have been overhauled in the sequel. So, for example, the Strider has been split now into the more specialized Thief and Archer, and in fact, they say that every vocation has been crafted to feel more specialized and unique. Itsuno said, the more of an all-arounder you make a vocation in terms of attack speed and critical distance, the less fun it is to feel like you're playing a particular kind of role. By making each of them feel more special, I hope the players will feel more motivated to improve and to take on the role of their given vocation within the game's world. So TLDR of that, they're really honing in the specializations of each one of the game's vocations. Now we do know uh, for a base, there's going to be six of these starter vocations, and then that sort of gives you a, a baseline archetype that you might want to fill. So there's the fighter who excels in melee combat using a sword and shield. The archer is all about long range with a bow and arrow. The thief all about speed, dealing rapid damage with the strikes from their dagger. They're really nimble. And then there's the mage who's all about dealing elemental damage to enemies while also supporting the team. But then there's the warrior who specializes in direct combat with big two-handed weapons. And the sorcerer who specializes in various magical attacks doing powerful long cast time abilities. So a distinguishing there between the sorcerer and the mage and the warrior and the fighter. They're again, really honing in on these specializations. But then beyond that, there's also the advanced vocations, which are more sort of combos. So these include things like the magic archer, who's all about ranged attacks and healing, or the mystic spear hand who combines melee with magic, or the trickster who conjures illusions through smoke, confusing enemies. And so each one of the classes in the game has all sorts of potential beyond those basic archetypes that I mentioned, different weapon skills, core skills, augments, and the ability to mix and match these as you please. It's going to be one of those things where no two characters of the same class or no two pawns created by characters are going to likely be exactly alike because there are that many choices. So that pretty much does it for that interview with Itsuno. Uh, lots of really cool, interesting uh, little tidbits out of there. Uh, in addition to that, though, I wanted to also quickly mention, I briefly touched on it, but we got a bunch of new gameplay from IGN. It was about, I think, 13 minutes or so of a gameplay showcase. We saw examples of multiple different characters going through what appeared to be the same testing area that we saw a few months ago. I believe at that time, people were allowed to play in like 15 to 30 minute increments. Well, apparently there were some additional hands-on with this portion of the game. It does appear to be sort of like a vertical slice area, but within that area, people could do what they want. So we saw a few different examples, multiple examples of different encounters and uh, some things I wanted to point out from this. So there were some really cool gameplay moments. Like for example, this one where we see a warrior player leaping off of a ledge, landing on and slashing the uh, ogre, I believe it was. And then after that, just standing on his head and driving his giant sword through the back of the creature. That was really cool. Probably, probably one of the few actual good gameplay moments from that section. That was a just some a little rough, but it's okay. You know, we, we only expect so much. Uh, there's also a ton of hilarious ragdolls, like I mentioned. Uh, they really emphasize this in this game. They're making good use of it. So at one point, we see a player get drop kicked by an ogre, and then the player ragdolls over a gap onto a bridge and narrowly avoids going over the other side of the bridge. Ragdoll physics, when utilized correctly, can just... They add a lot of comedy to the experience. I'll say that much. After assisting a player, we did saw this uh, clip of the a, a thief pawn kneeling down and covering himself in dirt, which does appear to be some sort of a camouflage ability, helping to, I believe, reduce the aggro towards the thief. That's really cool. And then also while fighting an ogre, we at one point we saw an ox cart. It was strolling by and then the cart stops to help you and your party take down the ogre. That's the kind of stuff that uh, a point towards this like sort of clockwork nature of the game where things are happening. And then as you're doing stuff and you have a fight near a thing, and then the, the characters in the world, be it enemies, be it other NPCs or 
your pawns, they interact with what's going on in interesting ways. And this is a sort of example of that that I think is really, really cool. We also get a brief glimpse of what was called the loss gauge. So how this is gonna work is when you take damage, not only will your remaining health deplete, but also your maximum health at certain points. Uh, basically how it appears to work is the longer you go without resting in between battles, the more max health you will progressively lose over time. And then that max health reduction can only be restored by resting either at an inn or at a campsite. And it does appear in Dragon's Dogma 2, they're really gonna be emphasizing the use of this resting campsite feature in particular, resting out on the go. And they enforce that by putting a mechanic like this in where your max health will slowly deplete over time the longer you go without resting while constantly engaging in combat to try to sort of create this push and pull this back and forth of resting preparing going out to adventure back and forth and back and forth uh, we did see some clips of a mage in plate armor which a lot of people got really excited about although current speculation is this is just from a universal set basically a set that can be used by any of the vocations in the game we don't know if the mage can actively uh, use plate armor besides this one particular set and not too long from now we're just a couple of months away uh, from Dragon's Dogma 2 coming out and like I said at the top I'm so happy that this game is looking so good I cannot wait this is definitely going to be one of those games I can already tell that will make me happily take a break from my obsession with MMOs and live servers and shared world games while that is typically my jam and what I usually like to spend my time playing when it comes to games every once in a while you get a good single player game that just really is appealing to me and this looks like it's going to be one of those if the original dragon's dogma is any indication uh, i expect to be playing this for some time and i cannot wait so there you go that is a uh the latest update for dragon's dogma 2 hope you guys enjoyed the vid thanks for watching as always see you guys next time